the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria commented, China brings a new form of imperialism. They take African primary goods and sell Africa manufactured goods without transferring learning. Okay, this, this is a significant criticism of China's investment in Africa. For a number of years, I was an advisor to Huawei, the China telecom infrastructure provider. They're, how, they're based in Shenzhen, China. And Mr. Rin, their CEO, their founder, top decision maker, said, he looks at Africa and says, all we're doing in Africa is business. It's just business. So you have a diversity of perspectives just among two folks here. Um, I have a dear friend, Andreas Schotter. He's one of my co-authors. We write together a lot. And the thing that he said when he started teaching that made him craziest was students thinking that Africa was a country. And his comment, Africa is not a country. 54 countries recognized by the African Union and two de facto countries that aren't yet recognized. It's over a billion people with a median age of almost 20 versus the global median age a decade older. So a large population, a young population. Real GDP has grown by almost 5% between 2008 and from 08 to now. It has kept that kind of pace. 40% of Africans live in cities. When I ask people who know nothing of Africa, where do people in Africa live? They think everybody in Africa is a village boy or girl living in a hut. That's the common feedback that we get. Um, not true, it's urbanized. By 2040, one in five people in the world will be from Africa, from the region. As I said, 40% of Africans live in cities. It's very close to China's level of urbanization. In fact, it's closing very quickly on China's level of urbanization. And it has surpassed India, surpassed Brazil, and it, as I said, it's growing. Lots of business opportunity there. When you urbanize, you need water, you need electricity, you need transportation, you need all kinds of good infrastructure. Africa's household spending totaled $860 billion in 2008. That's more than that of India, more than that of Russia. Africa has a larger middle class than India. Now you might say, whoa, wait a minute. India is a country. Africa is a continent. Well, the one thing that they both have in common is incredible diversity. There are more linguistic groups in Africa than any place else in the world, followed very closely by linguistic groups in India, followed very closely by cultural differences that you see within China. So you have China, India, Africa, very, very diverse locations. And learning how to do business in any one of those serves you well doing business in the others. Um, by 2040, Africa will be home to 20% of the world's population. And what that really means is workforce. They'll have the largest working age population in the world by 2030. When I talk to companies in China, they talk about Africa in some interesting ways. The big state-owned enterprises certainly think about uh, resources, natural resources, and extraction, as do big Indian companies. But when you go down just slightly, 
to the slightly smaller and more privatized companies, they talk about markets. When you talk to the Chinese government, they talk about Africa as an important market for goods and services. India does the same thing. By the time I'm done tonight, you'll see they play the game differently. Over the past decade, Africa has had seven of the world's fastest growing economies. That should stop you in your tracks. Um, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Tanzania, or Tanzania, depending on where you come from. Um, anyone here from that country? I'd like to hear how they pronounce it. Congo, Ghana, Zambia, and Nigeria. These are the economies that have grown very, very quickly. China and India are growing faster, but the growth in China and India is slowing as the growth in Africa continues to rise. There'll be an interesting intersection there very, very soon. African economic growth surpassed Asian economic growth in the last decade. This is all of Asia versus all of Africa. If you look at Africa's dynamic business environment, they have more than 1,400 publicly listed companies, more than 100 with revenues over a billion dollars, more than 316 million new mobile phone subscribers since 2000. That number is pushing 400 million now. That's more than the total population in the US. And what they're doing is leapfrogging technology. One of the challenges, blessing and curse for Africa, is that when mobile telephony became possible, people were able to install mobile telecommunications instead of copper wire communication. We have legacy systems in the US that ride on copper wire. Were they to have invested a similar copper wire system in Africa, it would have consumed all of the copper in the world at the time. So we're very happy that mobile telephony came along. And it has enabled all kinds of business opportunities and communication opportunities within Africa. Banking and retailing are flourishing. Construction is booming. So if we look at the business sectors, there are lots of business sectors that are very attractive. If we look at the countries, uh, those countries that have broadly diversified economies are doing better than those that don't. By broadly diversified, we mean they're doing manufacturing and services. Um, Egypt. Egypt has perhaps the most diversified economy in Africa. They have metals, they have food, they have petroleum, they have petroleum processing. Very broadly diversified. Morocco. Morocco is part of the breadbasket for Europe. They supply grain to Europe, heavy investment of agriculture and citrus. South Africa, South Africa trades extensively within Africa. And they're known for things like automobiles and more advanced manufacturing. Tunisia, Tunisia is rare metals. And, uh, clothing and leather manufacture. But if we look at these diversified economies, manufacturing and services are 83% of their gross domestic product. And in these countries, 90% of the households have discretionary income. When they have discretionary income, what does that mean? Think about it. when you have discretionary income, what does that mean? When you have spare change in your pocket, money in the bank. Oh, 
okay, you can not just pay bills, not just subsist, but you can do things beyond that. And that's what we see happening in countries like these. Retail banking and telecom have grown very, very quickly in this part of, in this part of Africa. If we look at the growth opportunities, consumer goods and services, by 2020, more than half of Africa's households will be able to afford non-essentials. Natural resources, they have 10% of the world's oil, 40% of the world's gold, 80 to 90% of the world's chromium and platinum. Uh, Africa as a region, is naturally endowed. In terms of agriculture, the growth opportunities we're seeing are in fruit, flowers, and vegetables. A couple of weeks back, we had, I run a program every year that's sponsored by American Express, where we bring in 10 social sector organizations. One of those organizations was from Kenya, and the staff that came in were from Malawi, and what they do is they, t they provide sanitary facilities, toilets, and they collect the waste, and they transform the waste into byproducts, energy, and fertilizer, and the fertilizer is used to drive the fruit and flower and vegetable industries, especially the flower industries in the region. And the flowers are shipped to Europe. And they get big bucks for those flowers, more than they got for the staple goods that they weren't growing. Um, that, that's an example of how this stuff works within a region. And in terms of infrastructure, telecommunications is still highly attractive. There are numerous business models that rely on mobile telephony within Africa. People bank online. People keep track of weather and um, agricultural updates online. Lots of opportunities with telecommunications. Transportation is really a big thing. There is a uh, road infrastructure that circles the perimeter of Africa, but not as much connectivity in between that uh, points on that circle. Lots of opportunities for transportation. And as Africa urbanizes, a lot of opportunity to build public transportation within the urban areas. And finally, the financial services industry has, is one of the, Africa is one of the fastest growing places in the world. If we look at growth in sectors, the consumer goods sector is really forecast to grow incredibly quickly in the next three years. The resource sector, not as quickly. Agriculture and infrastructure are both not as quick, but these are the four top growth sectors according to The Economist. And I do have to let everybody know I am not an economist. I'm just pretending to use some of their data tonight. Okay. Now, part of what we need to think about are what are some of the drivers of this growth? One of the things is that in the last decade, I'm going to back the story up to when I started studying about China. I had to fight with my committee to study China. They said, why China? Nothing's going to happen in China. Nothing's happening in China. Study Japan. Japan is growing like crazy. I personally thought that Japan was at the top of a downward slope. And I wasn't particularly interested in studying an industrialized economy. So I persisted with 
China. We had signed the accords with China, and I thought, at least I'll be able to see some activity that I can study and write about. Uh, reluctantly, my committee said I could study China. And indeed, I did see a whole bunch of activity. But at that point in time, in 1978, the world wasn't upbeat about China. In 1988, 1998, they were not upbeat about Africa. Part of what you can say is people get it wrong all the time. And when you come to Thunderbird, I hope we help teach you to not get it wrong all the time. Was, was I smarter than my committee? No. I was just a student of history and somebody who was terminally curious about big economies. The things that the African governments have done to help make Africa attractive are they put an end to armed conflict in many places. I, uh, sadly, we can't say every place. But in many places, they have managed the armed conflict. And that has helped create political stability and business loves political stability. They've undertaken mi microeconomic reforms that favor business. In many places, they've slowed down inflation. And they have adopted policies to energize their markets. They've privatized enterprises. And one of the things, I'm a diehard capitalist. One of the things that we know is Private industry is a driver of economic growth from the perspective I come from. And they've strengthened regulatory and legal systems. When you see a list like this, what you're seeing are governments taking action to build the platform on top of which commerce sits. Annual foreign direct investment is, foreign direct investment is the second thing that has helped drive Africa. Annual FDI in African economies reached $80 billion in 2014. 90% of the foreign direct investment comes from firms in industrialized countries most of them firms in the US or the EU. The US, the UK, and France still lead in this investment. Um, they invest the biggest share. Now, one of the things we hear in the press, in the media, pretty consistently is that China is taking over Africa. I want to dispel that myth. And India is saying, we're right behind China. I want to dispel that myth, too. South-South foreign direct investment is growing. It's uh, growing faster than North-South. These are unfortunate terms that are used by economists. North-South means industrialized country to developing or emerging economy. South-South means emerging economy to emerging economy. Has nothing to do with geographic location. And if you can think of a better term, we can start using it and shake the economists up a little bit. Um, BRICS collectively held investments of almost 68 billion in Africa. BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Well, Russia and uh, Brazil have minuscule investments in Africa. So we're really talking about India and China. But I'm sure nobody was ready for this one. Malaysia is the largest investor uh, from Asia in Africa. If I had asked you, which country is the largest investor? How many people, except Professor Booth, would have said, 
Professor Booth is from Malaysia, would, would have said this. Okay. I was blown away when I, when I discovered this. If you look at the businesses that are there, you have businesses that are in agriculture, palm oil. Uh, you have Petronas, which is the Malaysian oil and gas company. Pacific Interlink, that is a trading company. International Islamic Financial Center. And I was surprised when I saw that. A decade ago, I did work with Bank Nagara in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And at the time, there was one man that was at the, not at the top of the bank, he wasn't the governor, but he reported up to the governor, that was trying to identify opportunities for Islamic banking that Malaysia could engage in. And he was just certain that Malaysia could take on the Middle East. And we got into some good conversations about how deep are your pockets, how deep are their pockets. Think about it some more. And he came up with investment in financial services in Africa. And so when I saw that it was really happening, I thought, you know, sometimes when you teach, people do listen. If we look at China in Africa, China's economic rise is uh, particularly marked in Africa. We see it in Africa. It quietly surpassed the US as the continent's largest trading partner four years ago. That's five years ago now. Sino-African trade is estimated at 200 billion US dollars, and it's expected to rise to 325 billion. And I haven't been able to get good data to update these numbers. This is two years back. Brazil and India are right behind China and catching up. If we look at facts about China and Africa, almost half of China's cumulative foreign direct investment has been given to countries in Africa. Now, why do you think that is? Why do governments give foreign? Oh, go ahead. Part of it is linked, tied to infrastructure. Yes, we'll give you the foreign aid to build this hospital, to build this school, to build these roads, to build this bridge. That's a big part of it. And to that degree, China is copying the Japanese foreign direct investment model its investment with strings attached with the expectation of quid pro quo. We're going to do this, and there's going to be something in return. It's access to their natural resources. It's, it's, it's to get population. access to natural resources and also access to markets. You have to be able to get your goods in to sell them. You have to be able to get natural resources out to utilize them. So it's, it's very pragmatic. And I will make a sweeping generalization now. Chinese are nothing if they're not pragmatic. Most pragmatic people I have ever worked with. I grew up in Latin America. I've worked, yes, yes. Direct investment is usually targeted at an activity that will support business. Foreign aid can, is given by a government, and it's usually targeted at things like, um, oh, mosquito nets, clean water, fight aids, educate women, which are different kinds of activities than um, foreign direct investment. That's foreign direct investment. I decide to put a business in your country. That's foreign direct investment. 
Great question, Pam. Thank you. Uh, China is Africa's largest trading partner. Uh, China's trade with Africa is only 5% of its global total trade. That's why China looks at its investment in Africa and they conclude it's not a big deal. So why are we getting this global pushback about taking over in China? Why do you think? Um, it, it could have to do with power. It primarily has to do with visibility of Chinese investment and the structure of Chinese investment. And I'll talk about the structure in just a minute. More than 90% of China's imports from Africa are natural resources. That's part of the problem. You're taking our resources and you're not leaving anything behind. As I said a few minutes ago, I grew up in Latin America in the 50s and the 60s. And that was a time when the practice of multinationals with their foreign direct investment is what we would call rape, ravage, and plunder. They would go in, they would take resources, they'd go home, they'd leave nothing behind. And then there was a professor at Harvard, Ray Vernon, who wrote a book called Storm Over the Multinationals. And part of what Ray Vernon identified was the inevitable pushback that comes from that kind of practice. Unless you leave something behind, you're um, doing a disservice in the country where you're extracting. And if you look at China's practices, the first thing I noticed, and I had the pleasure of sitting through several thousand hours of negotiations of joint ventures between foreign multinationals and Chinese firms, was the Chinese government wasn't going to be fooled by that practice. You had to leave something behind. You had to form a joint venture to invest you had to transfer technology to invest. And if we come forward to today, you see the seeds that were planted then are creating global challenges now. But the Chinese were not disadvantaged, and the Lat like the Latin Americans were. In Africa, we're not seeing enough of those kinds of practices requiring training and development. Um, South Africa is China's largest trading partner and uh, almost 4% of China's trade with the EU, 20 billion. Yet Chinese officials say Africa's strategic importance to China remains low. Now go back to that slide where we talked about they're pulling out natural resources. If they didn't extract from Africa, they'd be extracting from Latin America, where they don't play that game, or they'd be extracting from uh, Middle East, not too likely. If we look at Chinese actual investment in Africa, 4% of their foreign direct investment goes to Africa. There are more than 2,000 Chinese companies in Africa. Natural resources and extraction are at the top of that list. But finance and financial services, Bank of China, infrastructure and infrastructure development, some to serve the purpose of um, market access and natural resource extraction, but some of it just general economic development to, sh to prove 
they're good citizens. Power generation, waste disposal, textiles, home appliances. Um, those of you who are students here at Thunderbird have probably studied the case study HIRE, H-A-I-E-R. That's the home appliances that we're talking about. Um, investment in mining and manufacturing is growing quickly. As the Chinese workforce um, starts to constrict, and it is starting to constrict because of graying, aging of the general population, and the historic one-child policy, you're seeing fewer employees. Manufacturing, certainly the assembly kind of manufacturing, is eyeing Africa and starting to move jobs to Africa in manufacturing. If we look at their investment, they have the largest presence in South Africa, strong investment in Nigeria, that's oil and gas, Madagascar, natural resources, Guinea and Sudan, Sudan is oil and gas. Uh, they've put a $600 million hydroelectric plant in Zambia hotels and tourist infrastructure in South Africa and Botswana. Part of what you're seeing, the hotels and tourist infrastructure is for two things. One, for Chinese hospitality, Chinese tourists to go to Africa, and two, for workers to have a place to live. They're constructing roads, bridges, sewage systems, and government buildings across the continent. So they're doing a lot of infrastructure development. Now I'm going to switch gears and we'll look at, Africa, at India for a few minutes. Uh, there are three million people of Indian descent living in Africa. This is part of the British legacy from the 19th century, but it's not only that. The concentration of people is in South Africa. Durban in South Africa has more Indians living there than many cities in India. Mauritius, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda all have strong Indian presence. The diaspora in East and South Africa has really created conditions for very positive ties between African trade and India. Their, their political approach in Africa has really emphasized development and training, de economic development and training of human resources. Very different from the approach taken by the Chinese. They've invested about 70 billion in China versus the 200 billion in Africa versus the 200 billion invested by China. They hold assets in Sudan, South Sudan, Mozambique, and Libya. Nigeria is India's largest supplier of oil. They just recently surpassed Saudi Arabia. Industri uh, India is di diversifying its sources of oil, wisely so. Examples of Indian companies in Africa, Jet Airways, Infosys, Sahara Computers, Tata, Coral Telecom, iFlex Solutions, Renbaxi, Dr. Reddy, Tata Steel, and Osho Coal Mining. Very diversified investment portfolio, more diversified than China's investment portfolio into Africa. Now here's the big difference. A lot of Indian investment in Africa is done primarily through private firms. A, a few big family-owned firms, a lot of smaller firms, versus the state-owned enterprises that China uses. India focuses investment on pharmaceuticals, telecommunications, transportation, and agriculture, food processing in agriculture. China and India use very different investment strategies. China goes in 
greenfield. They put new facilities. They build their own facilities that are vertically integrated, so they control the suppliers and the distribution. And they import Chinese labor to do the work and to build the facilities. There is where the negative rep reputation is coming from. I come to your region to take your resources. I bring in my own workers to do the work. And then I scratch my head. Why, why is this not OK? India is using a different approach. They primarily use acquisition of existing businesses. And they rely on local tr labor that if the labor is not qualified, they train and develop that labor. If you want to do a critique of both, one of the things you would have to say is Chinese companies do not rule the African economy. And this is a headline from Wall Street Journal that they did rule the African economy. Over 90% of the stock of foreign direct investment in Africa originates from the world's most advanced countries, most, mostly the US and the EU. The growth rate of foreign direct investment in Africa has been dominated by Chinese multinationals. If you look at what Chinese foreign direct investment is doing, it's doing this. India's is doing that, and the US sits somewhere in between. But it's less than China's investment. Uh, their presence is rapidly rising. India has been a latecomer to the growth opportunity in Africa. And Modi has told us, we're going to learn from China and not make the mistakes that China made. This is where the crystal ball comes out. When I got my PhD in strategy, that's, I'm, I'm a strategist by training. My father gave me two gifts. There was a figurine that I wanted. And he, he got that for me, a piece of Royal Dalton. And the other one was this beautiful Tiffany blue box with a gold bow on it, and it was heavy. Dad, what is this? And I opened it up. It was a crystal ball that he had picked up at a yard sale. And he said, Mayor, you're going to need this crystal ball because you're going to be asked to talk about the future for the rest of your career doing strategy. And he said, that's as good as it gets. Well, I'm going to stick my neck out here. Uh, Despite China's willingness to take on more risk than most Western countries, the economic slowdown in China, coupled with new players in Africa, new players like India, may slow the pace of China's foreign direct investment into Africa. There have been attacks on Chinese operations in Ethiopia and, and Sudan, and they've had to evacuate 35,000 Chinese workers from Libya. They're reassessing the degree of risk that they're willing to take in Africa. That's a big conversation at the governmental level in China right now. Do we want to continue with this risk? Um, and I say, despite all of that, China and India are going to remain very important sources of foreign direct investment in Africa for many years to come but they're going to continue to take their very different investment paths. Um, if you look at my rationale, because that's where the markets are, that's where the growth is, and that's where the natural resources are. And as I said earlier, the Chinese are pragmatic. The Chinese and the Indians follow the market. They both have large diaspora around the world. OK, now I'm going to put on my advisor hat. I advise quite a few governments, mostly in emerging markets, 
and I have done this for about th two decades. It's very important for African policymakers to take responsibility for protecting their own society's best interests. That's the number one role of government, protect the interests of your citizens. So when it comes to things like the rape, ravage, and plunder strategy, you have to say no. They have to ensure that the contracts signed with foreign investors include provisions to safeguard the environment, the health, and the training of African workers. One of the other reasons that China is under the negative spotlight is they're not the world's best at worker health and safety. Neither, neither are the Indians. I'm not gonna give either one of them much credit. Uh, and that brings negative publicity. And that's very controllable. Uh, and I'm not making the claim that they're not good in, in Africa, but they're good in China. They're not good in China either. And every time I have a platform to say so, I do. Mining industry in China is a disaster for worker health and safety. Same thing in Africa. They, the governments have to use investment wisely to raise living standards and enhance global trade and build infrastructure so that the lives of the people in the countries where this investment happens is enhanced more positively. I'd like to have a conversation afterwards about why this doesn't happen or, or if it does happen. But I have a closing thought. As I said, were I 25 years younger, I'd be on the ground in China. Africa is the new Asia. When I look at the exciting opportunities from a business lens uh, that I were, was looking at in the 1980s with Asia, in particular China, I think that Africa is in that same position. So if you're students, if you're thinking about a career, think about bridges between Africa and Asia. I think there, there's going to be phenomenal opportunity there. And then if you want resources or the sources I use, feel free to contact me and there's a link that might be useful. Okay, let's have a conversation now. I said all kinds of wild things. What do you think? You're pointing at some, raise your hand and, and oh, please. It's not the same kind of power game that you see with the US and China. I think China has power to the degree that it helps build infrastructure. And infrastructure is the bedrock on which governments can grow economies. So there's, there's a plus there. It comes with strings. I'm going to take some of your resources. Yeah. The, different strategies that India and China are, are pursuing really creates an opportunity for complementarity. I see the two as being, as having the ability to work together to um, help develop Africa. Not that Africa can't do it itself, but they bring the resources that uh, businesses, business linkages and so forth. But the governments in Africa are an equally critically important partner because without will there, nothing's going to happen. And the piece that isn't talked about by the economists, the people of Africa bring entrepreneurship, creativity, passion, uh, 
abilities and to the degree that China and India and African governments invest in the development of that potential, um, we've transformed the world. And as I said earlier, I grew up in Latin America and it kind of breaks my heart that uh, I'm not talking about Latin America like this, but I'm not. Great question, yes. Um, you said how uh, like the, the African governments need some responsibility mm -hmm. to make these deals and take yeah. investment for better people in the environment. Why do you think that hasn't always been the case historically? Because historically, Africa has been ruled by strong men, and they haven't had the interest of their citizens top of uh, at the front. We're seeing changes there now. It's not. Completely, it's not complete. The directionality is right. And I think perhaps media has helped here, where, where lots of eyes are on the situation. It gets harder and harder to be a strong man when everybody's watching. Um, and I'm hopeful that that'll change. I would love to see it accelerate. But that's why I think. Yeah. Like that. We're from Angola. And it was a similar situation where we had a big soccer tournament in 2010. Yeah. And they were running behind on some of the stadiums. Mm -hmm. So they hired a Chinese company to come in and kind of help them finish the projects. And they brought in their own workers' prison. It was a work release program. The prison was for labor. Yeah. And then by the end of construction, the tournament was renamed from the African Couple of Nations to the Orange African Couple of Nations, which was the Chinese company. The, uh, don't expect altruism on the part of China. It's not going to happen. Um, Africa is a resource to be exploited. Exploited from the economist sense, take it, in, engaged with, not, um, not developed. You, you don't see hordes of missionaries leaving Europe or North America going to Africa like you did uh, a millennium, uh, no, a decade back. But you for sure don't see hordes of Chinese uh, people going to Africa to do development work. It's not in their background and training. For Chinese, the loyalty is to the family. And the people in Africa aren't their family. It's a modern form. Well, imperialism was the yeah. term that was used. It's, it's a form of colonialism. It's not coming in and taking over the government, uh, but it's not, it's indirect, but it's not as um, severe as the colonizers of the 1800s. Um, you know, the British, that's why we speak English, folks. I have a question. Sure. Why did you have a conversation about Asia and Africa and not um, going to the rebuilding of the Silk Road? Um, because been, there's an excellent book that's been written on that. Okay. And I just figured that was yeah. that's the long term part of the long term goals for China going to Africa yes. and extracting the minerals. And I was thinking that would be more of a part of that. That's a different different presentation where I talk about the string of pearls in the Silk Road and only so much time. But great question. Sit tight. Next presentation I'll talk about Silk Road and the string of pearls. We have time for more questions. Hi, Mary. You have referenced at one point here that 30,000 was it Chinese laborers had to be extracted. Yeah. Um, based on their way of handling and how, how they do that extraction and bringing in their own members, was it more from that era of pragmatism rather than investing in the, the their local people? Or was that just a 
it happened because of turbulence within the they, country? It wasn't turbulence within the country. It was pushback against, it was pushback. against the Chinese practices and their lives were at risk. Did, so then that creates another question. Even though it bucks their culture, why not learn from that pushback and adapt, change, um, flex your approach? Some of the most adaptive companies I have ever seen are companies like Huawei. Huawei, before it sends people or technicians to work on the installation of um, their systems, their networks, puts their Chinese staff through extensive training. One of the big challenges is few people in Africa speak Chinese, few Chinese can map onto the hundreds of languages that are spoken in the places they go for infrastructure development. So you have some real pragmatic problems. Despite the best intentions in the world for a positive cultural interface, and that's why I advise a lot of our students to think about, our African students, to think about being that bridge. Lots of work there. Uh, because there aren't a lot of bridges. Where do you see <coughs> TSA taking its place over there with them, um, in Saudi Arabia, with uh, the pending IPO of uh, Aramco? They, the Crown Prince has said we plan to take our place among the G20 in the world, and they specifically called out Africa, and they're going to have trillions of dollars to invest. So how, how do you see them taking place, especially where they uh, they share a common religion with much of Africa? With, with parts of Africa. I would certainly think they would have an advantage with parts of Africa with investment. Um, I don't believe that either India or China has developed a high enough quality relationship, one that really endures across time, although India might have a slight advantage, uh, that a third player couldn't displace them. I think it's, it's realistic that that could happen. And I would say it depends on who buys a Ramco. That, that would shake the game up, too. So a lot of the story in Africa is a story of oil and natural resources. And Africa is so much more than that. But they have two centuries of um, resource exploitation that has kind of not enabled or favored economic development. Yeah. That they maintain dependency on those resources versus the diversifying their industrial base. The advice I would have is take your resources and vertically integrate. Transform those resources into goods that have higher value add. Don't don't enable value. Yeah. And that, that would be the prescription if they ask me. They haven't asked me. And there are lots of economists telling them this, too. I've been pretty harsh on China. What do you guys, uh, what do my Chinese students have to say about this? It's okay to, it's okay to criticize the professor. It really is. They're Taiwanese, Chinese. Oh, I, I've worked in China too long. Taiwan is the easternmost province. That's what I've always heard it called. But what do you think? They know China as well as any of us know China. Any comments? 
How about, what do you think? You're sitting there with a smile. You write, yes. There's a lot of opportunity for positive alliances to occur and, and to be reinforced on both sides. Yes. Thank you for the presentation, Professor. Uh, You're welcome, Cedric. Yes, uh, I lived in Congo and uh, in Africa, and I saw a lot of uh, Chinese investment, especially uh, in terms of infrastructure, infrastructure, and uh, it is it is seen or known. Chinese infrastructures, uh, they are not very good, uh, especially like in the Congo, I saw Chinese building okay. roads, and those roads deteriorate very easily you know, after a short, of, uh, a short time. So I want to know, uh, uh, is, it the case, is, this, is it the case in China as well? Do they build a uh, poor infrastructure even in China, or they do that only in Africa? <laughs> um, I'm going to use an example from when I grew up. We built a house in Caracas where I lived. And our contractor said to my parents, you have to watch them mix the cement. Make sure you get a six bag mix instead of a four or five bag mix. And part of what they were getting at was uh, when not watched, people cut corners and try to save money and be efficient. And when you don't hold your um, counterpart or client in high regard, you're much more likely to use a four bag mix as opposed to a six bag mix. And when, when I first went to China, one of the people working for a large automotive company was African American. He was a very dark complected black man and a big man. And our Chinese counterparts had a very difficult time shaking hands with him. It was almost stressful. And so I got people aside and I said, they had never seen a black man. They didn't have a real opinion of a black man. And these were government officials. These weren't um, people out of rural community. And so part of it could, is based in lack of familiarity. And that leads to lack of positive regard or lack of respect. And do they build bad roads in China? Bad buildings in China? Yes. They do. Not all, some. They've built bridges in San Francisco that the government of California has paid for and is very happy. And they're very happy with them. So is the potential to do great work there? Yeah. Part of it is that uh, lack of positive regard. And part of it is doing it on the cheap. So the thing that I would say, have somebody on the construction site who knows what they're doing and, uh, and don't back away from that. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's any consolation. You know, they have shoddy workers in China. So, but 
practically an origin in yeah. the city of Hangzhou, about 200 miles south of Shanghai, yeah. where yes. uh, the officials were on the take. And they, yeah. after it was built, they actually avoided that, that bridge. And sure enough, uh, a year later, that bridge did collapse. One, one of our alumni, a guy named Rich Brubaker, uh, he was the bartender at the pub here when I was vice president. And he has posted pictures of entire buildings that have fallen over <laughs> in China. So it's not perfect. And I would say the contractor wasn't on the job site when that building went up. I don't have enough first-hand knowledge to answer that question, but I'll tell you what my hunch is. When I was doing my doctoral work, I had a professor, Warren Bennis, who wanted me to study the topic of learned helplessness. He thought that that would play a big role in locales where people did not, people as a society did not move forward as quickly as others. And I suspect that if you grow up being told you can't do it, you believe you can't do it. And uh, that's going to take some fundamental transformation that's going to come from people like you who go home and know better. But one of the real challenges, many of our African students who come here, their parents say, please don't come home, please don't come home. My physician is African, my uh, primary care physician is African. And she's, she came over here to study and she stayed and she married a fellow African who also stayed. And their parents both say, don't come home, please don't come home, it's not good for you here, you have more opportunity. We all want more for our children. So there's a, there's a fundamental dilemma there. How do, you, how do you get the very people who can help drive the change in the right places? So I encourage all of my students to go home. But I've also seen, uh, depending on where you are, that maturity yeah. curve, right? Where, yes. you know, India and China, same, same paradigm. Same thing, yeah. And, and but now the economy has grown, differences being made. Yes. Yeah. Financial incentives to go back. Yes. You know, where a lot of where they're re re repatriating back to their. Where 20 years ago that wasn't necessarily true. Right. And, you know, give it, give it time. But instilling the mindset that yes, you can. There are lots of NGOs that are doing this. And I would encourage the support of those NGOs. You have to start somewhere. And at least they're doing what they can, where they can, when they can. Great question, very good question. Anybody else? Keaton, do you have a few more words? Keaton has a oh, more questions. Keaton has a question. Oh, uh, I've had Keaton in my classroom two or three times. <laughs> Keaton just wants to thank Mary. I'm going to use the third person the rest of the time. Thank you so much for doing this. Well, I think that, that I'll join everybody in clapping. And Great question.